Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today we're taking an old Ryzen 5 1600 system using the MSI B350 Tomahawk and we'll be upgrading it with the Ryzen 5 5600. But this won't be an upgrade guide. Instead, as you'd probably expect from us, it's a benchmark video. So I've already done the BIOS update, I've installed the 5600, and now I'm gonna show you the results. But before I do, Today's video sponsor is Thermal Grizzly and their Cryonaut Extreme, which is now available in a two gram syringe. This high performance thermal paste delivers maximum thermal conductivity thanks to an extremely small particle size and layer thickness. It's also very flexible, capable of standing up to sub-zero temperatures for extreme overclocking, but also performs exceptionally well for air and water cooling applications. So if your CPU or GPU needs repasting, then I suggest checking out the Thermal Grizzly range. Link is in the video description. Okay, so the Ryzen 5 1600 was released back in April of 2017 for $220 US. And at the time it was a cracking good deal, especially if you're building a PC for both productivity and gaming. The nearest competitor from Intel at the time was the Core i5-7600K. While it was a solid gaming CPU back in 2017, just a year later it was already starting to become inadequate. So, although the R5-1600 has unquestionably aged better, in 2022 its performance is very much entry level. However, just a few months ago now, AMD finally released the Ryzen 5 5600 for $200 US, or at least that's the MSRP. It can regularly be had for around $175 US. Now, in terms of performance, it's excellent, basically matching that of the 5600X, and is therefore comparable to similar priced Elder Lake parts from Intel. For those of you already in possession of an AM4 motherboard, the Ryzen 5 5600 is really a no-brainer. And if you happen to be using a first-generation 300 series motherboard, such as the B350 Tomahawk, you're in luck as the 5600 is now a drop-in upgrade. So to find out just how much of a performance boost R5 1600 owners are looking at, I'll be comparing it with the 5600 in 25 games at 1080p and 1440p using both the Radeon RX 6950 XT and RX 6600 XT with SAM enabled. So let's go over about a dozen of the games tested and then we'll take a look at the 25 game averages. But please note all 25 graphs will be made available to Floatplane and Patreon members. Okay, let's get into it. And we'll start with my favorite, Fortnite, a game that I've now started live streaming from my personal account on Friday nights. So if you want to get on that action, feel free to join us. It's a lot of fun. Anyway, if you happen to play Fortnite using the Ryzen 5 1600, you'll no doubt have found the performance quite acceptable, though those wanting to keep frame rates up over 150 FPS, for example, it can be a bit of a struggle. Basically, even with the 6600 XT, we were CPU limited using competitive quality settings. And then with the 5600, we're looking at gains as high as 85% using the 6600 XT at 1440p, seeing we're looking at the 1% lows. The margins did exceed 100% at 1080p, again, even with the 6600 XT, and we saw that average frame rate was boosted by an incredible 124% with the 6950 XT. Therefore, the more competitive gamers amongst you will enjoy the massive performance gains on offer by the 5600. And while the 1600 was playable, in the more action-packed sections of the game, the 5600 maintained much higher frame rates. And generally, I do like to play Fortnite with a solid 200 FPS on my 144Hz panel, and the 5600 has no issues maintaining that level of performance. Okay, time for some serious driving, and here we have the ACC results. Again, the 1600, it's playable here, but the performance is a little bit miserable. As we've discovered recently, cache performance plays a key role for this title. And this is a big part of why the 5600 is just so much faster. Whereas the 1600 has a total L3 cache capacity of 16 megabytes, which is really split in half, so eight megabytes is shared across three cores. The 5600, on the other hand, has a single large 32 megabyte L3 cache that's shared across all six cores. And we see that using the medium quality settings, both configurations are heavily CPU limited, but the 5600 was almost 80% faster, pushing the average frame rate well over 100 FPS, which I imagine is plenty for this kind of driving simulator. Next up, we have Cyberpunk 2077, and here we find up to a 72% performance improvement with the 5600 when using the 6950 XT at 1080p. But even with the 6600 XT, we're still looking at roughly a 40% improvement at 1080p, with a 15 to 20% boost at 1440p. So even for lower end graphics cards, the 5600 still offers a nice performance boost. 
And once again, for those of you targeting high refresh rate gaming, the upgrade really is quite massive. Of course, there are games such as Dying Light 2, which aren't CPU intensive at all, at least the single player portion of the game, which we're using for testing. Here, the Ryzen 5 1600, it did work out quite well. And with the 6600 XT, we were entirely GPU limited using either CPU. There is some separation with the 6950 XT, the 1440p, the 5600 was just 14% faster, and it wasn't until we dropped the resolution down to 1080p that the margin ended up opening up quite significantly to a 32% advantage in favour of the newer Zen 3 processor. Truth be told though, the Ryzen 5 1600 was very playable here, so the CPU upgrade isn't exactly necessary for this title. The same is also true for F1 2021, where the Ryzen 5 1600 was good for over 160 FPS on average, with 1% lows over 100 FPS. I'm certainly not a pro at this game, but north of 100 FPS does feel extremely smooth and the input is good. But if you're after more performance, the 5600 will certainly deliver, boosting 1% lows by as much as 73% with the 6950 XT while blowing the average frame rate up to over 300 FPS for an insane 103% improvement. Far Cry 6 is particularly sensitive to memory and cache performance, and although it doesn't utilize 6-core 12-thread processors all that well, that's not the issue here. Again, DRAM and cache latency will be the primary issue here, limiting the 1600 to just shy of 80 FPS for the average frame rate. Both the 1600 and 5600 did limit performance of the 6950 XT, though the newer Zen 3 part was up to 57% faster, and still 35% faster using the 6600 XT at 1440p. Forza Horizon 5 is another game that doesn't lean that heavily on the CPU, though to push very high frame rates you will need a CPU with greater throughput. The 1600 that's limiting us to around 140 FPS, whereas the 5600 can push up to and beyond 200 FPS, making it 73% faster to impair the 6950 XT. Even with the 6600 XT we're looking at a 29% performance boost at 1080p. So impressive gains there, though it is worth noting that even for high refresh rate gaming, the Ryzen 5 1600 was very usable in this title. Hitman 3 is another title that really played well enough on the Ryzen 5 1600, and for those of you using mid-range to lower end GPUs with quality settings targeting just over 60 FPS, the 1600 will really be as good as anything else. But if you want that higher refresh rate experience, an upgrade will be required, and at maxing out the 6950 XT at 1440p is possible with the 5600, delivering a 50% performance jump, and then 73% at 1080p. Moving on, we find the Rift Breaker was pretty rough on the Ryzen 5 1600, with frequent frame dips below 60fps. In fact, the average frame rate didn't even hit 60fps, while 1% lows fell short of 30fps. It was a very laggy experience. I'm sure that some will claim this level of performance to be playable, and while maybe true, it's far from optimal, and for me it certainly wasn't enjoyable. And this is where the 5600 comes in nicely, boosting performance with the 6950 XT at 1080p by 75% when looking at the average frame rate, and then a whopping 110% increase for the 1% lows. The gains were also very high at 1440p with up to 104% better frames, and we even saw up to a 62% boost with the 6600 XT at 1080p. Moving on, we have Rainbow Six Extraction, and this is another title where the Ryzen 5 1600 is able to deliver perfectly playable performance, maxing out the Radeon RX 6600 XT with the second highest quality preset at over 140 FPS on average, and then pushing the 6950 XT as high as 170 FPS. For the most part, the 5600 wasn't a huge upgrade here, boosting performance with the 6950 XT at 1440p by 19%, which admittedly is quite a lot, but it's also a lot less than the 70% we're typically seeing in other games. That said, at 1080p, the margin did blow out to 80% in favour of the 5600, so those seeking extreme frame rates here will be very pleased with this upgrade. Last up, we're going to take a look at the Watchdog Legion results, and here we're looking at a massive performance gain when upgrading to the 5600. Firstly, the 1600 really struggled in this title, only producing an average frame rate of 64 FPS, with a 1% low figure of just 47 FPS. In contrast to that, the 5600 improved the average frame rate by 67%, and the 1% low is by 57%, so big performance gain seen here. And even with the 6600 XT, big gains were again seen at 1080p, and although jumping up to 1440p with this mid-range GPU did reduce the margin, the 5600 was still up to 26% faster. 
Okay, so here's a look at the 25 game average. For those of you looking at upgrading to 6950XT levels of performance, either this generation or next, in today's games, the 5600 will deliver on average 72% more performance for those gaming at 1080p or 57% more at 1440p. So very substantial gains there for high-end GPUs. Now for mid-range offerings such as the 6600XT is still looking at around 40% greater performance at 1080p with a 15% boost seen at 1440p, though we did see a 20% improvement to the 1% lows. Now, here's a breakdown of the margins seen for each of the 25 games tested looking at the 1080p 1% low data when paired with the Radeon 6950XT. Here we saw on average a 70% performance uplift for the Ryzen 5 5600 with increases as high as 111%. The smallest gains were still around 30% though, so for high-end GPUs, this is a serious CPU upgrade. But even with current generation mid-range GPUs, the gains were still significant, as seen here when looking at the 1080p 1% lows with the 6600 XT. Here the 5600 was on average 44% faster. There were a handful of times where we were GPU bound, but that's to be expected when using a lower tier GPU. Still, overall, the 5600 proved to be a serious upgrade from the 1600. It's crazy to see just how far desktop CPUs have come in the last five years, especially at the $200 US price point. Back in 2017, you had the choice of the Ryzen 5 1600 or the Core i5-7600K, though admittedly the Intel CPU was more like $240 US, but close enough. Those two CPUs are now significantly slower than similarly priced parts in 2022, such as the Ryzen 5 5600 and Intel's new Core i5-12400F. Now, although the Core i5-12400F is a part we recommend to new system builders, it's almost a worthless upgrade for existing Intel users on LJ1200 or older platforms, as they will require a new motherboard. This is what makes the Ryzen 5 5600 a bit special in my opinion, as recent BIOS support has enabled those with 5-year-old motherboards to acquire it as a drop-in upgrade. Admittedly, that would have been a lot cooler if five years ago AMD were able to advertise that those investing in the AM4 platform back in 2017 would be able to slot in a new CPU on that very same motherboard as far out as 2022. Of course, they simply didn't know if that would be possible, and they certainly didn't know that the gaming performance gains would be so extreme. I'm sure they hoped they would be, but without a crystal ball, they simply couldn't have known back then. Unfortunately, what this means is some users who invested in AM4 back in 2017 might have sold and upgraded their motherboard for Ryzen 5000 support, but those who didn't will have been rewarded. Of course, there's plenty of AM4 owners who have already gone from something like the Ryzen 5 1600 to the 2700X, the 3600X, 3700X, and so on, as many of those parts were available brand new for well below the MSRP. So it's likely that only now that an affordable Zen 3 CPU is available that those users are considering upgrading to Zen 3. Unfortunately, they can now do so without having to replace their motherboard. And of course, there's also those of you who are yet to upgrade at all, because although the Ryzen 5 1600 certainly looked slow when compared to the 5600 with an extreme high-end GPU, for those using a more modest GPU, the 1600 isn't nearly the bottleneck shown here. Moreover, plenty of you play games that don't require hundreds of frames per second, or games such as Dying Light 2, which lean much more heavily on the GPU than they do the CPU. So, for those users, the Ryzen 5 1600 is probably still battling along okay, but with the ability to now acquire a Zen 3 CPU for as little as $175 US as a drop-in upgrade, for many, I suspect that'll be an offer that's simply too good to be true. And it sure would be nice if Core i5-7600K owners and their expensive Z270 motherboards had the ability to drop in something like the Core i5-12400F. Hell, even a 10th gen part would be amazing. But no, they got nothing but a sharp stick in the eye when Intel released the 8700K just nine months later. And rumor has it, Intel's 14th generation, which is due to arrive next year, will move to yet another new socket with 2,551 pins. And that means LJ1700 will be dead later this year once the 13th generation arrives. So I guess to harp on with this point yet again, AMD really does need to officially commit to AM5 and they need to do it sooner rather than later. They've now proven just how significant of a feature continued platform support is with AM4, and they now need to cash in on it with AM5. 
So let's hope they do just that as it would be a big win for consumers. In the meantime, feel free to give us a like if you enjoyed this video, subscribe for more content. And if you'd like to become a Harbour and Box community member, get some really cool perks in return, then check us out on Float Plane or Patreon. You get access to a monthly live stream with Tim and myself where we answer your questions and talk about whatever's happened throughout the month. Uh, we have a Discord server for Harbour and Box community members, Q&A stuff, behind the scenes content. So a lot of cool things there if you're interested. But if not perfectly fine, I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time. Mm -hmm.